you know what I was going through back there. Please I, don't lay that on me now, man, because I'm not interested in hearing any of that. Did it ever occur to you that your old pal Digman might enjoy a great stay at some mental hospital out in the middle of nowhere? This one, you kind of saw some Wes Anderson in it, but at the same time, he's evolved his filmmaking since then. Oh, yeah. So he does something different. Like, this, like basically, um, this was more of a precursor to what, you know, Rushmore ended up being, you know, that type. And then he went on to, you know, with Royal Tenenbaums, and he started doing different things with, like, you know, set pieces, and the art direction was changing and stuff. But this, obviously, like the Coen brothers, you know, he didn't have as much leeway financially to do exactly what he wanted. But him and uh, Owen Wilson, and, you know, went to film school together, and they wrote they wrote this movie, and it changed quite a bit as well, like anything else does, just like Blood Simple did. And they filmed this one uh, a few different ways, tested it out some you know i mean literally like you know types of uh like between the lenses they use the scopes i mean the, this did all the shots they, they, were, they did a ton ton of different stuff and they try to see what works and what doesn't work and um the final cut that they got actually was, was pretty good and you see a lot of wes anderson in the script in this not so much um a, li a little bit in the way it's shot because you know, if you're direct, I mean, you're not going to, Wes Anderson didn't veer off from how he shot movies very much. He has kind of expanded on it a bit. So you can tell, like that's his film, but uh, the interaction between the characters themselves, definitely a Wes Anderson movie. Well, that's so, and it was, and for being his first film, you know, he knocked it out of the park with this one too, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, you're able to get Jimmy Kahn, number one, great, great performance um in the movie um just overall good performances by the wilson brothers i'm a huge luke wilson fan even though owen wilson did write this movie i think luke wilson did a great job in the movie um their brother andrew wilson and his small cameo and he shows up in quite a few wes anderson movies um overall like you said you know i think a really really solid first movie you know, I think this has a lot more in common with like Rushmore than it does anything else after Rushmore, I think. But definitely you can see a lot of those early flourishes of his work. Yeah. So when you first start out, I mean, it's obviously more difficult to receive funding and find investors and everything. I mean, James yeah. Kahn's agent just said, uh, hey, you should do this. You'd like these guys. And James Conn's like, you know, I'm not sure what James Conn was even doing at that time, if he was really doing a lot or whatever. Maybe he was just like, you know, I'll take a chance on this. I'll have a good time and do it. And he did. He liked it a lot, he said. But uh, he, right. he grew he grew, he grew, grew a big respect for Wes Anderson. And one he, of our, I mean, and he's, and he's uh, Wes Anderson's one of those guys, like Bill Murray said, is he's one of those automatic yeses. You know, if he calls him, he says, hey, I need you. Yeah. You know, no matter what he's doing, he's like, yeah, I'll be there. You know? So, you know, there's a few directors that have big time actors who who will who are that loyal to them and Wes Anderson's one of them because how creative he is and he's another one who writes his own movies and storyboards his own stuff and has his own vision his own you know like I said the art direction he has his own idea of what he wants to see how it's made and everything he's very meticulous and this was like I said this was since for a for first film it was good but I you know in all in the span of all of his movies I'd probably still put this in the lower half, but that's just because he got better. Well, know? that's what we're gonna what we're gonna do is eventually once we get get through all of them, we'll put them in our own. You know what you would rank them to be mm -hmm. throughout. And definitely, I would agree with you. It's definitely after you see, you know, Wes's full work. It's 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 like a solid debut album. You know, some bands, their debuts, their best album. This is definitely not his best, but you could see the workings of where he's going and where it's going to go. Um, I also think, look at his career, and then, like, let's say, look at Owen Wilson's career. They've had completely different careers since this movie has kind of been released. Um, Wes Anderson's, you know, this movie, I was uh, reading that Martin Scorsese found it to be one of his favorites of the 1990s. So you're saying to yourself, well, if Scorsese likes this movie, you know, 
He's if, yeah, if that could be your first movie. Yeah, and your first and your first movie. Well, and Scorsese, you know, he he understands the struggle of a first time director. You know, I mean, he made like I said, this. I mean, we discussed this before. You know, we both like Mean Streets a oh, lot, yeah. Yeah. but it, it isn't one of his best movies. Eh, probably not one of his best best movies, but like, it's a really good movie and it's very Scorsese esque. So you well, see that's... where he's going with it, you know. So this is very similar in that vein too. Well, that's why I'm curious. He's got two movies coming out this year. One's called Asteroid City, and the other one's called The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm always curious when he's got work coming out. You know, yeah, the his his last handful of movies, like I said, his Grand Budapest Hotel, Royal Tenenbaums, um, The Life Aquatic with Steve Sisu. I mean, those are probably my favorite ones. And then his French Dispatch was fantastic. Um, That's pretty good. Like some Moonrise Kingdom, who had Francis McDormand in it. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, that those, a great those, movie. those are probably. But Isle of Dogs, for what it is, the way it's shot. It's Isle of Dogs good. is fantastic. Yeah, you know, for, for what it is, you know, that's that's what he's doing. I mean, his I'll never forget going where we will be going tomorrow when I watched the Royal Tenenbaums the very first time. Mm-hmm. And, man, it was a group of six or seven of us. And to have the whole group really laugh and enjoy that movie and the world the royal tenenbaums is uh oh. right there with like with if, if you're going to compare it to a coen brothers movie it's, it's like right there with the big lebowski to me yeah. you know it's it gets funnier every time you watch it because there's always something else you catch in there that maybe you didn't see before and you're like oh. lebowski your favorite coen brothers movie yeah it is i mean it's, it's an easy it's, I mean, it's easy to say that is because a lot of people, you know, love Lebowski, but it is. It's my favorite one. The World Tenenbaums is my favorite uh, Wes Anderson movie. Um, and there, and and like I said, like as good as Jeff Bridges was as Jeff Lebowski or the dude, like I thought Gene Hackman was just as awesome as World Tenenbaum. Yeah, and just as hilarious, dude. Like in a different way, but like the movie is just it's just brilliant man we laughed probably harder in that movie theater at his lines than anybody else uh, because he was just i mean man gene hackman we've we've went over it before he's just he's he's awesome and yeah whatever you put him in i mean you put yeah. him in there, he's awesome that's kind of like a little bit like james Conn. you know what i mean mm-hmm. looking when i was researching um bottle rocket before for coming on you know um which is funny. He wanted Bill Murray, but Bill Murray kind of said no. And then Bill Murray said yes to Rushmore. And now, as you said, he's an automatic yes because he knows. I mean, Bill Murray, um, for, for what it's worth, I've heard sometimes could be difficult to work with. I don't know if that's true or not. And he seems to work very well with Wes Anderson. So, you know, I think that's a, a good matchup with those two. Yeah, and he doesn't even need to have a leading role in his movies, you know. No. He's had um, bit parts. He's had supporting roles. He's had lead roles. You know, it's he's had all sorts of them. He just does. He's like whatever you need me to do. He's like I'll do it. Well, that's why it's t- it's tough for me. It's tough. It's the same thing with music. It's tough for me. Which there, are, hey, I'm I respect anybody's opinion, but it's tough to like not find anything enjoyable about either Wes Anderson or, you know, um, the Coen Brothers, especially being film. You know, because some of their work is, it's like it's close to other directors that are awesome's work. So I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, there's there's people out there that don't like them, um, don't like Wes Anderson. Not so much the Coen Brothers. There's not a lot of people I don't that I know that don't like the Coen. I know one person who doesn't. We both know one person. But um, there's not there's there's a handful of people that just, that just don't like either like just get his humor. I don't this don't like it's kind of like the way that people are with Monty Python sometimes. Like it's if you don't like him, you're like that. It sucks. I hate it. I hate. But that. like I'll admit, okay, I'll never. I'll admit I was 12 or 13, and my cousins were watching. Um, uh, what's that? Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is this? Turn this off. This isn't funny. Let's put airplane on. Let's put naked gun on. Then as I got older. And I sat back and watched those those Monty Pythons. I realized, first of all, how wrong I was because they're just as funny or sometimes funnier, but that I wasn't mature enough yet to take in maybe some of that humor. Um, a lot of these movies, uh, Wes Anderson especially, as you stated, I don't... You're, that doesn't, like, to me, when somebody... And 
there's a lot of people like this, as you've stated, but you either like it or you don't like it. I don't really ever prescribe to that because that's like saying for nine movies, two hours each, that's 18 hours that you're saying one joke won't hit with you. That's just so weird. But hey, people have their own opinions. And Wes Anderson is definitely, um, well, he's polarizing. And um, Bottle Rocket is definitely, I would say, I mean, I think if you like just straight up movies, I don't see why you wouldn't at least give well, Bottle Rocket a I'll shot. I'll tell you this. People who don't necessarily like Wes Anderson would st- would be more apt to like this film than maybe his, some of his That's movies. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So like it's to me, this is like, you know, re- to t- bring it up for the hundredth time, David Lynch's Elephant Man, you know, something a little bit more accessible where you can see, you know, still a great movie. Um, but maybe not as much of the intricacies of what Wes Anderson is in a lot of his movies, especially like Steve Zaizu or something like that. Yeah, this is this is more of a cut and dry comedy, and you know, with it's it's a very creative, very creative dialogue between these people. But and that's what makes it fun. That's what drives it. It's his other movies. Um, like I said, it you're, you're in a different world. You're in Wes Anderson's universe, the life of Quad, like the way you're on the ship, or World Tenenbaum's the way that you're in the house on Archer Avenue, um, Grand Budapest Hotel, like that whole that whole universe is like a different Wes Anderson universe you're in. This is kind of before he was able to he filmed like that. So this is more of a straightforward puts, cut and he dry. Puts a lot of work. He puts a lot of time and a lot of effort into his movies. I mean, this movie came out in '96. And he's only got this year. He's only got. He's only has nine released, and after this year, he'll have eleven. But to say nine movies in almost 25, 26 years, you know, he puts the time in. He puts the effort. You know, they're worth. You appreciate those. You know, you, you, yeah. you know, it's it's not like the old days where you know back when the movie studios ruled everything, where they make you oh you got a contract, so you're going to churn out three movies a year. You know, these guys, you know, it's not like that anymore. Thankfully. And they can put a lot more time in, and he's one of them that really does. And he's one—I said he's one of my favorites, one of my top five, one of my favorite directors. Very, very awesome, very awesome on Bottle Rocket. Very awesome talking about both of their first works. Now, speaking of awesome, we've decided to talk about tonight in depth on a great actress performance. Tonight, we will be talking about the great Elizabeth Taylor, Liz. What's your opinion on Liz Taylor? So Elizabeth Taylor, I was never a huge fan of Elizabeth Taylor growing up. That was more my mother was always a fan of Elizabeth Taylor. My dad liked Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I think my father liked more the movies she was in. My mom liked Elizabeth Taylor more herself because whenever um, God, I remember something about Pamela Anderson. This was this was like in the late nineties when Pamela Anderson was on Baywatch and she was on TV or something. And my mother mentioned that woman's not beautiful. Elizabeth Taylor was beautiful, you know. And when you're a kid, you're like, oh, whatever, you know. He looks some chick in the fifties and sixties, and it's like, then as you get older, you're like, yeah, 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 you're right. You know, it's like it's it's you, you start seeing more of that natural beauty and things. I mean, she's still the only actress without contacts that that had violet eyes that i've seen that was actually the genuine article just had violet eyes naturally but she you know she was born uh in the 30s and started making movies as a kid when she was 10 or 11 years old um she was you know in national velvet and uh father of the bride um a place in the sun when she was younger and then she started making uh you know more movies as an adult uh, my parents would always watch Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with uh, Paul Newman and uh, Burl Ives, which I always like to remind people that Burl Ives is the one that sang the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song. <laughs> and because a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, you know, she made Giant. That, that was before she made those Tennessee Williams movies, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and suddenly last summer. Um, but she was awesome in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Annoying as hell, but like it, it, that, was, that was her character, you know, next to Paul yeah. Newman. But, uh, and then she, you know, she gained fame, you know, probably right around then, like superstardom. And, uh, she was in Cleopatra, which there she met Richard Burton, which started that whole romantic saga. 
and Cleopatra, you know, for what it is, one of the great epics that a lot of people that, that a lot before. of people I know still yeah. haven't seen. Yeah, yeah, honestly, before coming on here, that's what I was watching uh, clips of. That's a good movie right there. And it's 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 almost like two movies in one. It's like the first part's her, like you know, with Julius Caesar, like Rex Harrison, then with Mark Antony, you know, Richard Burton. It's like two different films. Uh, during that filming, she actually uh, had pneumonia real bad, got hospitalized, and she had a tracheotomy done. And you see, like in the movie, it's weird. If you pay attention, you'll see a scar on her throat in some scenes that she developed, you know, because they actually had to cut in there. And some scenes she doesn't have it because Ooh. they filmed that part before she got ill. And then afterward, you can barely, it's not something you notice unless you're really, really kind of looking for it. It's like Harrison Ford's a little, you know, mark on his chin or something. It's one of those things where you don't really notice unless you're looking for it. But, and she acted in some great movies of Richard Burton. We've discussed Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf before oh, yeah. a few times. We love that movie. Oh, yeah. And, uh, she, uh, you know, obviously had a on-off relationship with him. She was married to him a couple times, and but that was the great love of her life. And I, you know, I I love Richard Burton as an actor. He was always just unbelievable as a theater actor and um, obviously on screen. Uh, she was uh, a little st side story here. She was married to, uh, I believe, it was a producer named Mike Todd. Yep, and. They didn't, and then this one didn't end in divorce. He actually died in a plane crash. Yes. Now he was buried in the same cemetery that my father was buried in. Really? In, Sh in Forest Park. Yeah. Jewish really? Waldheim Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And, but his grave was grave robbers dug him up and took his body, his remains out because supposedly he was buried with heap. She supposedly she put a ring on him or something when he was buried and they tried stealing the ring or something. So, his body is now at some kind of as, as like an undisclosed location, but I still think he has a memorial or something at the same cemetery. When I was there, I didn't see it. I did find uh, Clara Peller, the, the where's the beef lady? She's buried in the same cemetery as my dad. But um, other than Ooh. that, you know, I was looking for Mike Todd's, and I was like, you know, I'm like that's interesting. That and then, yeah, someone actually did I, that. I could be wrong about this, but. Uh... I'm pretty sure she really liked Mike Todd quite a lot too. When he no, she there. did. And like, you know, like it was, but they were only married like a year, I think, before. Yeah, that. but it, it was, was like one hard. of those things that you know, when some people look back when someone passes away and is like, "Oh, I think that was the love of my life," but they passed away. I've heard her say that a couple times because then his friend didn't his friend swoop in, Mister Eddie Fisher, and Eddie Fisher, yes, and then he Fisher came did. in, and then and then uh, that's that's and then she divorced him. I think she went to work with Richard Burton. Yep. Because they were filming Cleopatra, started having that whole affair, and then Richard Burton ended up, you know, pretty much to being be a love fly. Him. Honestly, I, and that's why I love uh, Virginia Woolf so much. Because I love, I'm a huge empathetic person, so I imagine a lot the kind of conversations they had when no one was around and it was just them two, even mm -hmm. if they were drinking, whatever, uh, the deep, whatever they were talking about. I'm sure they talked about so much stuff. You know what I'm saying? And that's. In in those movies, you know, a lot of that, you know, she poured a lot of that out into those into those movies. I think she did, and she kind of, I think she peaked too early. I mean, I wish she, she would have done a little more. Yeah, in her later career, I'm, you know, honestly, the, we're, the first time I ever saw her when I was younger was in, was in uh, North and South, the miniseries. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I saw her as she was, she was obviously older by then, but, you know, then I started hearing about her a bit then, you know, from my parents and then seeing some older movies she was in. But uh, suddenly last summer, she was fantastic in that movie. That's a great movie. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the VIPs is another great one with Richard Burton and Louise Jordan. And, uh, you know, she went to you know, Virginia Woolf right after that. But, um she kind of peaked in the, you know, then and her career kind of waned. She was always in a philanthropy, though, and she was... Uh, she was really big in a philanthropy. And she was very good friends with uh, Montgomery Clift. Yep. And then she ended up becoming friends with Michael Jackson. Very fa Michael he's a very fascinating... I've read a lot about him. Very fascinating. Montgomery fella. Clift is a very fascinating guy. And that guy, you know, he kind of reminds... Yeah. Who suffered a, you know, a bad car accident that kind of derailed him. But even after that, he was fantastic. Right up and he died at a young age. He reminded me a lot of like the early kind of like those actors we were talking about earlier, like the ones who just kind of like they got those acting chops 
for that time period, you know, he was different than your stars at the time. Which, oh, you uh, watch him. I mean, you watch him in a movie like From Here to Eternity. Oh, yeah, he's I great. mean, he's as good as Burt Lancaster in that movie. He he carries it as well as anybody else. Um, and in just a smaller part in Judgment Nuremberg, the way he, I mean, it's Montgomery Cliff was awesome, and it sucks that he died when he did. She's but, good um, friends with Rock Hudson, all that in the 80s. She was with right there yeah, with she all was of about, that. She started in a couple movies with Rock Hudson, or at least one movie with Rock Hudson. She's um, just, you know, all around just a really awesome actress. Yeah, she she was uh she was a good one and which she would, like you said maybe some more seventies work maybe in some gritty seventies movies that kind of would. That's my thing, you know. It, it's her personal life kind of took over her star, you know. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's it's, and I shouldn't say it's sad because it, she lived obviously a fine life, but and she went through a lot of husbands. But that's what the, the story became: her and the husbands and all that stuff. But if she would done, I think she would have done some really good seventies and eighties stuff. She would have been. She was she was good enough in the sixties, obviously, but like. She really could have been, you know, even oh, better. Yeah. She could have took it up. I mean, in a different, you know, but I've also heard too, there back then there was a lot of, if now actresses couldn't get a role when they get a little bit older, I knew that she also, a lot of actresses weren't also given some opportunities. Maybe that could have been it also too. A little bit. No, older. there were very few back then that, um, especially the early actresses and stuff, once they were getting older, I'm talking back to the silent era, 30s, 40s. Once they were getting older, it was probably, it was, it, it was done. But like, was, you know, you had a few of them, you know, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford were able to do it. Catherine Hepburn was able to do it. Those are your bigger ones that were able to maintain their stardom from the, you know, 30s, 40s, you know, on. But um, there's very few that can, especially when your personal life takes over like that. It's, you're in a tabloid, you know. Social media now, we see a lot of it, but like back then it was like, you know, she was on every crappy tabloid you can think of you know every inquirer star magazine whatever and that was that that's your first that was my first this is what elizabeth taylor is you know yeah <laughs> but i really got to know who she was that's know? where i got to know her on those people magazines that my mom was yeah, doing, you know, around the like, house and i'd be like oh who is and she, just like you she'd be like ah oh, she was beautiful and then i look at these pictures but now that i'm more mature like what i look at back then is that uh i mean you got I mean, she's a juxtaposition to your Marilyn Monroe's, your blondes, you know, she's dark hair, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and that's in, you know, I, I love dark hair and she definitely pulled, she was definitely awesome, definitely an awesome actress and a lot of good roles. Um, yeah, there was, there was, she was, she was good in a lot of good movies and she starred and she held her own and I just held her own, but was, you know, as good, if not better than the opposites that she was with her male opposites that she was starring with whether it, was, whether it was richard burton or you know whoever rock hudson you know it, it didn't matter yeah well what was awesome is that uh what your your pick today is this month is national female month so it was an excellent excellent first pick for the um actress showcase before we head out here really quick like every time you're around here i got a couple dvds to ask you to see if you've seeing these movies let's let's take a look at movies here of course you've seen this movie this is the one that we've talked about sizemore's best heat yep did you, one of my uh, did it's you... in my top 10 all-time favorites oh okay Ooh, top 10 all time which mm -hmm. it should be it's a great movie um there's a question i got to you about heat since now i got you and you've obviously watched it a whole lot val kilmer in the movie okay mm -hmm. now i don't know if you've ever noticed this there's a couple scenes in the movie where his elbow is enlarged. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in the movie. No, I never noticed that. Watch the movie. And when you notice it, it I, I've tried to do some research. I don't know if he got like hit, but it's like abnormally huge in a couple scenes. Worth checking out. Something to think about. Next movie. You ever see So I Married an Axe Murder? Yes, I've seen that one. <laughs> Which I respect more now than I did even when I was younger. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't respect Oddly it. Oddly enough. I, I didn't really respect it when it first came out. But unfortunately, again, looking at all of his work, Mike Myers, I could respect that a little bit more than like Austin Powers 3. You know what I'm saying? I can well, respect. Who, that's Nancy Travis, right? That was Nancy Travis. Yeah. Oh, Nancy She Travis. was in a Chaplin. Oh, yes. That She's really good in. She um, was in that movie. So that was the first time I ever seen 
saw her, I was like, I remember seeing her, and I'm like, I was trying to put my finger on Nancy Travis, my foot champ, and I'm like, oh, that was a girl. She's me. really good in um, with um, Richard Gere and Andy Garcia in Internal Affairs from like yep. 1988. Oh, I she, forgot all about that one. Yeah. That's a pretty good movie. You ever see Black Rain with Andy Garcia and yep. Michael Douglas? That's a really Scott one. That one's pretty good. Um, next up here is, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. This is a good movie by Jonathan Demme, um, Something Wild. Oh, yeah, I've seen something wild. That's Ray that, Liotta, that, man. Ray Liotta's great in this movie. That I remember, I remember seeing. Um, it was a Saturday Night Live episode, and Chris Farley was talking to Jeff Daniels. <laughs> and like, yes. when he was yeah. a Chris Farley show, and he's like, yes. right, and you know, yeah. and he's talking about something wild. Yes. I heard of something wild at that point, and I watched something wild after that, and I was like, dude, that's an awesome movie. Well, what's really cool, I always found out about something wild was that was pretty much what. <laughs> That's what the uh, what what are their names? The uh, brothers who did the Dumb and Dumber, the Zucker the Fairly, brothers, the Fairly brothers, Fairly brothers. That was the Fairly brothers. They were like, "Well, we'll get Jeff Daniels," and someone was like, "Oh, he's not funny." And they were like, "Well, did you ever see something wild? He's kind of funny in that movie." Actually, like, the one show I was telling you I was watching, I think I was telling you about this, uh, Louder Milk. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Fairly, Fairly. I think I don't know if it's both of them or one of the Fairleys, the ones that made that show. When um, we when we got this house, this lady in the garage, she left a box of DVDs and old DVDs. Most of them were were no good, but I did save this one, and I ended up watching it a couple years ago. Um, you ever see Marlon Brando in Sayonara? Yeah, I've seen Sayonara. <laughs> Actually, Sayonara was that was on TCM. I think it was like two months ago or something. Yeah. Whenever I go through my DVDs and I look at Sayonara, I, I, I think of I think of you because it's an older. It's one of those older 1957 movies that are 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 really really that gets lost in a lot of Brando's work because you know his early not since well yeah sort of early movies in the 50s and stuff like A Streetcar Named Desire on the Waterfront things like that those are the ones you talk about and sign art kind of gets and then from you know what was it? uh I was trying to think of another one it was um but he there's there's a couple of movies that he did. And that movie in particular kind of gets lost in the shuffle. No one ever really talks about it. It does, it does get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. That's why we bring it up here. You know, we got to bring up the ones that get lost in the shuffle. And this last one, if you've never seen this movie, I'm going to uh, bring it for you tomorrow. This movie is written by Billy Bob Thornton and it stars um, Bill Paxton and Billy Bob Thornton. It's called One False Move. You ever see this movie? No, I haven't seen that one. I'm going to bring it for you tomorrow. You're going to love this movie. Um, it's it's like a new, it's another noir movie. If you look if you look right at the top here, not that these guys matter, you might have heard of them before. Siskel and Ebert, two big thumbs up. One of this year's best. Definitely worth for you uh, checking out. Um, Billy Bob Thornton, he can write a little bit, and he can direct obviously sling blade is a pretty good movie i think it's not he's movie. another one you know how many how many movies have you seen by bob thornton and you're like oh he wasn't very good in that you know it's yeah. like well, the movie itself wasn't very i mean everything he does works one that's been on showtime recently a sam raimi movie um uh what's that one the a simple plan another mm -hmm. one with him and bill paxton where they lose the money or whatever and uh, bridget fond is in that one but Billy Bob Thornton is he's a good actor and he's another one who I think for a while I didn't when I was younger he was like I didn't really wasn't as big on him as now there you're right any movie I've seen him in I'll even go back and watch movies you know I like him a lot even with John Cusack and the Ice Harvest Fantasia Police officer, freeze! Alan Barkin. Um, just a great, great all-around actress. Lots and lots of great performances. Um, some of the performances that tonight we're going to talk about here um, pretty quickly, or not so quickly, or it depends on how you look at it, is these four movies. Now, she has lots and lots and lots of performances. But the four that I wanted to uh, focus on tonight or five, are The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, Eddie and the Cruisers, Sea of Love, This Boy's Life, and Ocean's 13. Though not brought up, she's also in 
Diner. Um, she's in a movie that stars Mickey Rourke called Johnny Handsome. Um, Mickey Rourke's also in Diner, which he's in both of those movies. Um, but tonight's movies I wanted to talk about was her performances in, well, let's start off with Buckaroo Banzai. She plays Penny Pretty, uh, Peggy Banzai. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome character. Um, first of all, the movie is a sci-fi movie. Not going to go too much in depth on the movie. I want to talk a little bit about her performance in it. But uh, in the movie, pretty much, she is the love interest of one Buckaroo Banzai. And pretty much, uh, Banzai pretty much um, looks at her and realizes that she's his late wife's long lost identical twin sister and bails her out. So right there, you're saying to yourself, that is a pretty, pretty cool role for, you know, the year that this movie came out, 1984, you know, playing a, a twin sister in a sci-fi movie and the lead character realizes it. And then you go on being, you know, the female lead in that movie, I think is, is really, really cool. Um, the, her next movie that we're going to uh, talk about is Eddie and the Cruisers. Okay. Uh, she plays in Eddie and the Cruisers. Uh, Maggie Foley. It is a, 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 a an uncredited role. But uh, definitely, I think when she shows up in this movie, it's definitely um, worth seeing or even checking out. Um, this is a really awesome movie. It's a good musical movie. I think uh, definitely if you have not sit down and watch this movie... I kind of don't even want to give away her performance because it's so, you know, it's not huge, but check it out. It's an awesome, awesome um, musical biography. Uh, See a Love, which is probably my favorite of all of these. I don't believe in wasting time on this kind of stuff. You know what you know, and you go with it. You go with what? You're just not my type. just sat down you know i believe in animal attraction i believe in love at first sight i believe in this and i don't feel it with you i don't believe more so you're saying to yourself, uh, to be able to tell pacino that in a movie this movie is hardcore um a thriller um I definitely like this movie a lot. I've watched this movie quite a bit. It's probably my favorite of all of her movies. Um, it's just not like a straight up uh, romantic movie. It has a lot of, uh, there's a lot of twists. There's a lot of turns. Uh, Pacino does a great performance in it. Um, John Goodman has a great performance in it. Richard Jenkins has a pretty good performance in it. Um, good twists. Um, oh, excellent twists. Um, Definitely worth your time on 1989, but her performance as the love interest in this movie, and she's also uh, who becomes um, the main suspect in the crimes that are being committed, the murders of suspects. Um, I like this movie because every time the murderer kills somebody or at the scene, he leaves the song Sea of Love, Sea of Love, on, and it's, it's really, really, really good. Um, next up is her performance in This Boy's Life. Um, another great movie. Um, going with Pacino and then doing a movie with De Niro where she has to play a mother to one Leonardo DiCaprio, an early performance of his. Uh, oh, I can't. It's, 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 it's the kiss of great film, I could obviously say here. Um, De Niro plays a scumbag to all degrees, really not a nice father who she marries, but she has to play the mother-in-law, the mother, not the mother-in-law. She has to play the mother that has to be in between this battle that goes on between, between them, you know, and you're saying to yourself, you know, is she up for the task? Well, she's more than up for the task to play Caroline Wolf Hansen. You know, she is, she's going against Dwight Hansen. That's De Niro's name. And her son plays Toby Wolf, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, but just great. Another great movie all around um definitely worth your time to check out um not on the screen but she's really good as a news reporter is in the fan um she plays a waitress in fear and loathing in las vegas that's a really good movie 
Um, but the last one up here on the screen that I'm going to talk about is um, her performance as Abigail Sponder in Ocean's 13. It's a little bit of an, um, one of her, what's the word I'm saying, uh, like later later roles, even though she is was really, 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 really awesome on Animal Kingdom. It was on TNT about five or six seasons. She played um, a mother, and that was a remake of an Australian uh, movie, but uh, definitely check her out in all of these performances. I definitely think that they are um, more than willing and fitting of your time. Um, everything that I've talked about here are all worth it. Um, please, you know, check out, check out some, check out some Ellen Barkin, you know, why not? You know, great actresses, they need to be paid attention to, you know, she's definitely one that I believe needs to be, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Paid special extra attention to, you know, really, 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 really good stuff. So check out Ellen Barkin. Next up here, We've got uh, an in-depth, um, we like to mix in a little music, a little music and movies, some movies and music, um, one, of my, one, of my, one of my many, many uh, specialties. So tonight, I'm going to take a look at Purple Rain, um, the 1984 rock musical drama, um, also scored by one prince. Yes, that prince, the man, the myth, the legend, Prince. And his band, The Revolution. Um, the movie is pretty much generally, um, I, I like in this movie, is 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 really to showcase Prince's talents. Um, generally, uh, a pretty, I would say the storyline is just pretty much, he has struggles at home, struggles his relationship, just your normal struggles. But interwined in these struggles is some really, really great music. Some really, really, really awesome um, performances by not only what I would say Prince himself, but you have uh, Apollina Cotero, Morrissey Day, Clarence Williams the Third, um, playing father, Jerome Benton, Jill Jones, Des Dickerson, Wendy Melvoin, Liza Coleman, The Time. Um, really, 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 really worth it. Um, you could say that um, through you know, through history and through time and through everything, this has definitely um, been been what I would call uh, uh, one that ha has definitely, definitely uh, rocked and definitely um, rolled a movie. You guys, get off it. I mean, like, can't you just leave it alone? I told you already. I'm not going to do your stupid music. Now get off it. Yeah, we'll get off it. So you say to yourself, you know, this movie's got to be got to be made up of some great, great, great tunes. And let me just tell you, it's one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. You know, you have everything from Let's Go Crazy, Take Me With You, The Beautiful Ones, Computer Blue, Darling Nikki, When Doves Cry, which is one of the biggest songs of all time, I Would Die For You, Baby I'm a Star, and my lord, that final track, Purple Rain, what the movie is named after. Um, just, just, just deep. Just deep, 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 deep. Um, again, the movie is about a, a front man of a, mini, a, mini, a Minneapolis-based band. Um, has a lot of abuses going on. Uh, his father verbally and physically abuses him and his mother. So he spends his days rehearsing. He gets it through his music. Um, there is just lots and lots and lots of that. Pretty much what I just said, but deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into that. Um, after the success of his album, 1999, he wanted, uh, he would not renew his contract unless he got to uh, star in a studio film. That's pretty, that's pretty huge. Um, David Geffen and Richard Pryor passed on producing the film. Um, kind of bad news on their part. Uh Warner Brothers wanted John Travolta to replace Prince as the film's lead. <laughs> Don't make me laugh on that. That's pretty good. Uh, definitely just, 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 I love reading back into a lot of the stories. Um, um, the filming took place in October 
well, it began on Halloween in 83, uh, 42 days it took. Um, things like the First Avenue nightclub um, were used. Um, the IDS Center um, was used. Uh, things in Los Angeles like the um, Huntington Hotel was used. Um, you know, in one day it says here, uh, and the last day that he wrote When Doves Cry that quickly, he, he needed one more song and he pretty much just pretty much busted it out. I mean, go around and say that this, this movie is just generally an all around success is definitely, um, not, is not, you're not, you're not, you're not saying anything that people don't know. Um, um, Prince had a nightmare, he said, when it was open, before it opened, that Siskel and Ebert hated the movie. Quite the nightmare to have, I would say. Um, but the soundtrack, the music, everything that's available in this movie, um, I would definitely say is, is, is worth every piece of your time. Um, Purple Rain is definitely worth um, checking out. It's a big difference between you and me. Thought you weren't gonna play no more. 